as he is graciously as he is graciously getting the guitar just listen to what this precious family was saying in song throughout and especially in that last song we know that in all things everybody say all things, all things. what you're going through right now that includes all things right we know that all things work together for what now, many of you stop right there. Many of you don't continue that verse. And I can tell you right now, all you have to do is look around, listen to the praise time tonight, and you know it's not working together for good for the devil. Amen? Amen. So things always don't work for the good. Finish that verse. Here it is. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose amen? amen whatever you're facing tonight I want you just to leave it at the foot of the cross it's not that we don't love you Raymond it's just that I needed to borrow a guitar here for a moment just move your mic over the mic standing totally unscripted it's uh, kind of short kind of short that's okay this song's going to be kind of short so it's a perfect guitar for Let me, if I may borrow that chair right there just for a moment. Thank you so much. I've been coming to Lancaster County for many years, long before I knew I had Amish and Mennonite friends, and I had spoken, I think, two different occasions at Lancaster Bible College. Um, I was one of the featured speakers along with uh, Annie Ann, I think is her name, right? Anybody have an Annie Ann Pretzel every now and then? So we were there for part of a business program. But as I have been coming to Lancaster now for a number of years, I have this uh, wonderful picture of my dad who went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. And uh, one of my Amish friends had put one of the big black hats on his head and said, you are now an honorary member of our community. And he loved this little medley. And uh, somebody else just greeted us as we came in tonight. My precious 93-year-old mom is here with us. Uh, before before uh, Dad went to heaven, they celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary. And uh, we went on a 6,500-mile missionary journey this summer, all over the Northwest and down through California and back through the Midwest. And then we were here in Lancaster just on Thanksgiving Eve, had the privilege of speaking to a group and then heading to Holmes County, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But somebody greeted us as we came in and said that uh, uh, their dad had recently uh, passed away at 93, and uh, that's how old my dad was, that's how old my mom is right now. And we used to sing this as a family, and as I saw you just blessing us, singing as a family, I thought there is enough gray hair out here that you're going to remember a few of the old songs and we'll just do one medley and I'm sure my brother's gonna follow along here. Everybody sing it out with us, here we go. Well, one glad morning when this life is over I'll fly away to my home on God's last shore I'll fly away Well, I'll fly away and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. Well, I'll fly away. Oh, glory. I'll fly away. Hallelujah. By and by, I'll fly away. Will the circle unbroken by and by Lord by and by there's a better home and it's waiting in the sky Lord in the sky well do Lord oh do Lord oh do remember me
the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, Lord, I want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in, and when that trump begins to sound, when the trump begins to sound, Lord, I want to be in that number, when the trump begins to sound. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Can I just kind of use this as my, my podium here? You can. All right. You can, sure. <clears throat> I have one more presentation here for you. You were talking about being more than conquerors, and some of you have, have read my book. It's called How to Conquer Giants, and I want to present this to your family, and I want to do so in asking the question that I start this book with. I want to ask this of everybody, and I want to read it verbatim here because it deals with where we're headed into the Word of God tonight. My opening question writing this book from the perspective of Solomon, who grew up in the household of a man after God's own heart. And he asks this question, how big would you make your goals? Whatever that means to you right now, I hope it's going to be something different at the end, but how big would you enlarge your territory? How big would you make your goals? How big would your witness for Christ be if you knew that you could not fail? How big would you make your goals if you knew you couldn't fail? I pass that to you, brother. Thank you. I want to read the rest of that verse that our family was singing about. God searches the hearts. He's searching your heart right now. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also Glorified. Did you notice that all of those were in the past tense? The calling, the justifying, the glorifying. I want you to catch that. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, past tense, and whom he called, them to also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? Who knows what comes next? If God... Say it with me. If God be for us, who can be against us? Do you believe that? Yes. See, to the degree that you get a hold of that, to the degree that we get it in our knower, to that degree we'll walk in freedom. See, if God's not for us, we ought to be very afraid. But if God is for us, we ought to conquer fear. Amen? Amen? Yes, Too many in the church today are walking in fear. Fear of things, fear of men, fear of circumstances. And God says perfect love casts all of that out. Amen? How many of you like to be a little freer when you leave here tonight? How about a little freer day by day until you see him on that day? What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all... How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What shall lay anything? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. 
Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again. I want to pause there for a minute. I want to drive this point home. When I was preaching in Russia, I filed through quite a lengthy line to see the see-through coffin of former communist leader Lenin. To this day, some 90 years after he died, he is still laid out there in Red Square in Russia. And you can file past and you can look in his coffin and his dead, embalmed body is still there. Somebody said, why would you stand in line to go see that? I said, I just want to make sure he's dead. Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> but somebody in the Communist Party had made a placard that said, Here lies the Savior of the world. Can you imagine? Christians, let me ask you something. Aren't you thankful that we cannot file past a see-through coffin and see Jesus' body in there? Amen. We could go to where Mohammed supposedly rose into heaven, and if we could call into that grave, Mohammed, are you dead? He'd have to say present and accounted for. If you went to the Hindu shrine, if you went to the, the tomb of Buddha or Confucius or any of the other so-called world leaders and religious leaders who have ever lived, if we called into the caverns of the dead, are you there? They'd have to say we're here. But if you and I took a road trip and we left Lancaster County on a flight to Jerusalem and we walked out to that tomb, and we called collectively, as loud as our voices would generate, Jesus, are you in there? You know what we'd hear? Silence. Because the tomb is empty. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We're about to celebrate the birth of the Savior. Did it happen on the 25th? Well, we have a 1 in 365 chance. That's not the point. He was born into this world, and the cradle is empty. He died on the cross. And I say to my Catholic friends when I walk in and I see the crucifix and he's still on the cross, I say, that, that's not according to the book. The cross is empty. And if we were to go to that tomb, we would know that the grave is empty. Listen to this, and I conclude this portion of the reading. Who is he that condemneth? Have you ever been condemned by another person? You ever had somebody put you down, slam you, say things about you, treat you badly? Listen, there's one whose opinion we need to hold dear. And he's the only one who went to the cross for us. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are... Does it say we are conquerors? Doesn't say that, does it? It says we are more than conquerors. If you are more than a conqueror, this is my prayer for you. I'm just going to give it to you up front here tonight in case anybody has to leave early. This is my prayer for you who came out tonight. I want you to sense this. I want you to... Say this, not in these words, but in the attitude. And I want you to live it out. Far more importantly than your brother Duke wanting it for you, your Savior wants this for you. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say that with me? I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to hold on to that. Wherever you fellowship, whatever your tradition, whatever your background, when we stay over in Holmes County, our Amish 
family that hosts us. We sit into the evening hours pouring through the scriptures, and my friend Jonas Koblenz said, Brother Duke, the more I listen to you, the more I think of what my bishop reminded me of recently. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. He said, the bishop said, Jonas, remember, you're only going to be Amish till you die. Now, if this is revelation for somebody here, there is not an English section in heaven. There's not an Amish section or a Mennonite or a Brethren section. There is one large gathering of the blood-bought saints. Hallelujah. I asked you from the opening line in my book, how big would you make your goals if you knew that you couldn't fail? I forgot to turn on my timer here. I want to be very conscious here of the time because there's more coming tonight, and I, I want to just offer my part, okay? I'm finished with low living, walking by sight, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and puny goals. We're through with that, church. Come on. We no longer need preeminence or position. We don't have to have promotions or plaudits and certainly not popularity. We don't have to be right or first or tops or recognized or praised or rewarded. You know why? Because we live by faith. Say that with me. We live by faith. We lean on His presence. We walk by patience. We lift by prayer and we labor by Holy Spirit power. My face is set. This is my prayer for you. This is my hope for you to have this attitude of the heart that my face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road may be narrow, my way can get rough, my companions might be few, but my Holy Spirit guide is reliable. Amen? Amen. Amen. And therefore, our mission is clear. And therefore, we're not going to be bought or compromised. We won't be detoured or lured away or turned back or deluded or delayed. We'll not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of the adversary. We'll not negotiate at the table of the enemy or ponder at the pool of popularity. We're not going to meander in the maze of mediocrity ever again. And therefore... We're not going to give up, shut up, or let up until we've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. Amen. We are disciples of the King of Kings. We must give until we drop. We've got to preach until everybody knows. We've got to work until He comes. And when He comes back for His own, He'll have no trouble recognizing us because our colors will be clear. Amen? We have to remember who we are because of whose we are. Let me say that again. We have to remember who we are because of whose we are. When we talk about living a life that pleases the Lord, that means many things to many different people. There was the crowd. There were 70 who loved to be part of the inner circle. They weren't the throngs that would be on the hillside when Jesus would come out to preach. 70 pushed in. There were 12 minus Judas, now 11, who were the inner circle of the apostles. Maybe you would be content to be one of those 11. Maybe not. Maybe you would like to be part of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John. Do you know that they had greater responsibilities than the other disciples? And with greater responsibility goes greater reward. That is a fact. And that is the measure giving and the measure coming back to you. When you take on more responsibility for the Lord, you will get greater rewards for that. And Peter, James, and John are proof of that. They were there when one was raised to the dead that the others didn't get to see happen. They were there, of course, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they saw something amazing and saw into the eternal while they were right here. But do you know that there was one 
There was one who was not even content to be in the inner, inner circle. And he always referred to himself as the beloved or the one that Jesus loved. I'm convinced that one of the sons of thunder never got over the fact that his Savior loved him. Do you sometimes just look in the mirror and you say, I know what the Word says. It says that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. But the one that I'm looking at in the mirror today, I don't really feel much like, and I'm not really thinking much like, and I sure last night didn't act much like the righteousness of God. But you see, it's not based upon what you feel, it's based upon what He says. Can I give you a two-part formula that will clear the entire Bible up for you? May I do that? Here it is. Rule number one, there is a God. Rule number two, you're not him. Amen? Amen. You and I would do things differently. We would have the outcome to be different. We might have done something different with that person or with that group or something different with the business. But you see, we're not God. And he has to take in your life and mine the black threads. And he perfectly weaves them in and out of the silver gold threads. So that one day when we are in eternity, we will be able to see that the trial was not for nothing. That what you're going through even now has a measure of difference in somebody's life forever and forever. You as parents know that you can't say to your children, well, do as I say, not as I do. And we as the church can't do that either. Here's what your non-Christian friends are saying about you. Or they're certainly thinking it if they haven't said it to you. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely point the way. Because the eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel can be confusing, but your example is always clear. And the best of all the preachers are those who live their creeds. For to see good put into action. Say those three words with me. Put into action. That's what everybody needs. I can soon learn how you do it. If you'll show me how it's done. I can watch your hands in action, but these words too fast can run. And the lectures you deliver might be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my sermon, please, by watching what you do. Because I could misunderstand you and all that great advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. You and I have been called to live lives that play out in this way. Let your light so shine that people see your good works and give you the glory. Is that what the Bible says? Of course not. Let your light so shine so that people see your good works and something within that heart that God has already opened up, they'll know that it wasn't your goodness. When I was ordained to the ministry 31 years ago, A wise minister said, Duke, don't even fill up somebody's tank with gasoline and give them $50 worth of groceries and send them on down the road and ever let them think it was because of Duke's goodness. Are you with me? You and I can sometimes, by elimination or by leaving out a few key points, we can let somebody else think that that good thing that we did was because we're good. There's only one, only one, who can claim that. We often think about those six hours that he was on the cross. We should think about it more. But we often think about it to the detriment of the real sacrifice that Jesus made. We have no idea what that feels like to have the the facial hairs ripped to your face is bleeding, to have a crown of thorns shoved onto your head where those long three-inch Thorns just pierce the scalp and the the front of the eyes here. Can you imagine having nails driven through your wrists and through your feet? But far worse than that is that he took your stinking sins and all of my stinking sins and he nailed them to the cross and then he made a declaration And this was some 2,000 years ago. I'm pretty sure it still stands valid today. 
it is can you get excited about that it is finished I mentioned that my mother and I did this 6,500 mile tour and there were parts of the West that we couldn't even see on our trip Mount Rainier in Washington for example it was completely clouded in smoke from all the forest fires and a forest ranger had gone through after the burning and saw the charred remains of a bird and pretty sure that this bird was dead but wanting to make sure with gloved hand he knelt down and he pushed gently on this bird and the bird in fact was dead and fell over but from underneath that dead bird came three baby birds now that mother bird knew that the fire meant danger that mother bird had the ability to fly miles and miles away from that danger and that mother bird chose to stay in the forest and cover those babies with her wings he could have called 10,000 angels he could have let the passing of the cup take place but what did our Lord say when he won the victory in the garden the night before not mine but thine would you say that with me not mine but thine see all things work together for the good of those who love God and are the called according to his purpose some of you are going through what you're calling hell on earth and I get it I know what you're saying it's it's kind of like saying it's raining cats and dogs we're not looking for bodies flying out of the air it's an exaggeration trying to express something in the extreme so when you say I've gone through hell on earth or I've I've gone through such torture and torment some of you are facing that tonight and at the conclusion of the meeting maybe when other people have already had to get on home some of the leaders here and I'll join in if you'll let me and we'll pray for you we'll pray for your business we'll pray if you're not sure that you're heaven bound the devil would love to rob you of all your joy he'll trick you he'll use circumstances that seem good and he'll call them bad and bad things he'll call good and the Bible says woe to that man or that woman who does that there was an ancient story of a farmer thousand plus years ago in China and they were having many different wars in the country there was a man who had one horse that one horse was his livelihood and that one horse got out of the corral the people in this small Chinese village came running out and they said to the farmer we're here to share in your bad news but the wise old farmer said is it really bad news or could it be good news the people scratched their heads they thought he was crazy five days later that one horse I guess hungry scared comes back to the corral leading five wild horses with it this farmer by standards in China at that time was rich and so the people of the village came out and what do you suppose they said to him we're here to share in your good news but he wisely said is it really good news or could it be bad news they were really confused now this man's crazy he's rich and they go back into the village but his 13 year old son was helping him to break those wild horses and he was thrown violently against a tree and broke his leg in two places they weren't sure if they could even save the leg so the village people came running out and they said come on we're here to share in your bad news but he said is it really bad news or could it be good news they just wrote him off as insane now he goes away and they go back to town but you see in that small rural village China in such a fight with the Japanese was calling up ten-year-olds and above to military service many of whom were being killed and that young man 13 years old with a badly broken leg 
was spared having to go to war. My friends, some of the very things that you are going through or have been through, you've called it something that is, is bad. And I just want to encourage you tonight, don't weigh that based upon your feelings, but weigh it based upon the Word of God. Spend more time on your knees and less time talking to people about the problem. Spend more time taking a walk around the farm or down the lane and crying out to the great God of heaven. Lord, I don't get it. I don't see it right now. But I'm asking you who sees perfectly. You, the one who knows the end from the beginning. The one who is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I'm asking you to reveal to me how to take this trial and make something beautiful from it. I'm asking you to take this test that is about to kill me and turn it into a testimony that brings life to many. Are you willing to say whatever you're going through, not mine, but thine? Florence Chadwick was the first woman in history to swim the English Channel in both directions. I used to teach swimming when I was a kid. I competed. I know what it is to swim long distances. Nothing like she was swimming. And for her to be able to swim in one direction in the North Atlantic, that freezing water, that's one thing. But for her to swim against it and to make and complete that journey, that's something totally different. And she is in the record books. So one day Florence Chadwick was going to be swimming a fairly routine swim for somebody of her stature. And that was swimming from the coast of California... There's an island called Catalina, and she was swimming from Catalina Island to the coast of California. Something happened that day in Florence Chadwick's swimming career that had never happened before. Before she got to the end, she said, I give up. A boat with her coach in the boat, and her mother was almost always in the boat, shouting encouragement. She couldn't touch the boat or she'd be disqualified. But they were allowed to stay within three feet of her. And that day they'd even hired a professional marksman because there had been shark sightings in Catalina Bay. But it wasn't sharks. They didn't see any. And it surely wasn't cold water because this was California, not England. What happened to Florence Chadwick that day is happening to some of you. Why did she quit? The fog rolled into Catalina Bay, and it was so thick, she couldn't see three feet in front of her. She couldn't see the boat three feet beside her. And she swam, and she kept swimming, and she kept swimming, and she didn't know if she was really making progress. And finally, she just said, pull me into the boat, which ended that attempt. If she was ever going to try it again, she'd have to start over. They later found out that Florence Chadwick had quit about from here to the exit sign there. She told a Los Angeles reporter, look, I'm not making excuses. But if I could have seen the finish line, I never would have quit. Your brother Duke came from St. Louis. Drug my 93-year-old mama in to the airport in Philadelphia at 11.30 last night, rented a car, and drove here. I fed her her dinner at a little after midnight last night. Why? So that I could encourage you to keep your eyes on the finish line so that you keep swimming. When you see the Lord Jesus Christ at the finish line... When you take your eyes off the problem and you put your eyes on the solution, you just have to be inspired to swim. Let me go a little different direction here. How many did Gideon's army end up with? How many men? Good. 300. How many did it start with? 32,000. When he released the first group of fearful soldiers, 22,000 of them left. They were already, even with 32,000, outnumbered six 
to one. The Midianites had 180,000 soldiers. 20,000 go home because they're afraid. I wonder how many people in your church community and mine are going home from work each night afraid. Trying to struggle to get up on a Sunday morning and boost themselves up a little bit so they can be part of a fellowship. But not really engaged because they're living in fear. 20,000 of them just took off. Of the 10,000, God said, you still have too many soldiers. If there were ever a time that somebody maybe had the right to question God, at least in the human sense, it could have been Gideon saying, let's see. <laughs> it was 6 to 1. Mm. Now then it's 18 to 1. Uh, Lord, could you check your math again? He said, there's still too many. See, some of you, you want a solid foundation, but you're trying to create your own, and there's only one cornerstone. Amen? Amen. To the degree that we get that and stand firmly on the cornerstone, so shall we be firm in the way that we deal with people, the way that we see the Word of God, the way that we live out our testimony. God said, Gideon, let me... Uh, let me get on with this. you got too many. I'm going to test them for you. I want you to take them down to the creek there. And what were they to do? How was he going to sort them out? Those that would go and be victors and those that would go home. Do you remember? We got some laps here. You ought to know that one, right? Here's what I think took place. It's not exactly spelled out this way in the Word of God. But I think that this is a reasonable way that it went down. I believe that in that hot, arid country, that when they were released to get a drink, it would have been natural, and I emphasize the word natural, not supernatural, it would have been natural that those 9,700 who were eliminated came down to the river... And they just put their faces down in it and they began to drink. They took their eyes off their leader Gideon. They were completely vulnerable to the enemy. But there were 300 who never stopped looking at the one giving the command. And they lapped up the water. And they kept looking, ready to go in a moment's notice. And God said, those are the men that I'm going to use for the victory I've already promised. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter, the author and the finisher of our faith. How many of you would say you have a strong faith? How many of you developed that faith yourself? Now, I'm kind of kidding with you a little bit, but technically it's not your faith. Paul would say, I have been crucified with Christ. How many of you have been crucified with Christ? I just see a portion of the hands here. Listen, we have a wonderful time in the evening here where we're going to, at the conclusion, make sure that some of you who, in fact, are not sure that you're heaven bound, we want you to leave here with the ticket. We want you to be certain. We want you to have that blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. Oh, glory divine. We want you to be an heir of salvation, purchase of God born of His Spirit and washed in His blood. We want it to be your story. But you see, Paul knew after studying under Gamaliel, the rabbi's rabbi of his day, he knew that the law was not the answer. He knew that the law condemned him and he needed to find an answer. And when he finally, by the Holy Spirit's power, got it, he said, I, 
I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That of in the Greek language denotes ownership. It is His faith that saves us. It is His faith that strengthens us. It is His faith working through us that others can be set free too. And so I ask you, are you content to be among the crowd? Are you content to maybe press in a little more, assume some leadership or maybe a little more sacrificial life and be like one of the disciples of old, the eleven. Maybe you're even willing to step further into the depths of God's Word and His call on your life so that you would be like a Peter, a James, or a John. But the reason that I came here from Missouri is to see which of you might join me in my quest to be one like John who on the night that Jesus was betrayed, in oriental fashion of that day, they did not sit down at tables with a chair, comfortable. What did they do? They ate off either a low table or the floor, leaning their feet away from the table, typically leaning on an elbow, eating with the other hand. But the Bible clearly reveals on the night that Jesus was betrayed, John wasn't leaning in on his elbow. Where was he leaning? On the breast of Jesus. What does that tell me? It tells me that John not only figuratively, but literally heard. He heard the heartbeat of Jesus. Do you want to hear the heartbeat of Jesus? Do you want to press in? It's sacrificial. It's something where we have to make choices in life. It's something where we have to assess life in the eternal and not the temporary. In 1956, Jim Elliott was one of five American missionaries who were speared to death by the Aka Indians. Days after they found their bodies, they found Jim Elliott's journal. And in that journal, Jim Elliott had written the words that have since become famous, He is no fool to give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. May I say that to you again? You're no fool to give what you can't keep anyway in order to gain what can never be taken from you. Say this with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall have everlasting life. Let me ask you this. How long is everlasting? Your life in Christ doesn't start when you take your last earthly breath and you take your first heavenly breath. Your life in Christ begins here on earth when you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I want to live for you. I don't need the applause of men. I don't need the condemnations if they give them to me or commendations if they give them to me. I just want to live for the one who died for me. When you genuinely want that, life changes. And to the degree that you grab hold of that and fix your eyes on the prize, you will change. And the people around you will change. Some of you think, well, I'm, I'm too busy. I've got a big family. I've got big responsibilities at work. I've got a lot going on, even in ministry. Some of you think you're too old. Some of you think you're too young, not educated enough. Let me tell you, one of the privileges I have of 
being among people many times that have listened to the moment of inspiration. They ask if I would share certain stories, and this is one that was requested. And I love sharing this story because it appeals to each one of us to take a closer look at what we've been called to do. To think about it when somebody else says you can't or you shouldn't or you won't. I think of a woman named Edith who was 66 years old when she decided to go to nursing school. And her best friends tried to talk her out of it. And this was their reasoning. Edith, how old do you think you're going to be when you get out of nursing school? And with a glow, she said, I'll be exactly the same age as if I don't go to nursing school. This little school, little college, got a bid to a national invitation tournament, and they were preparing. They didn't expect to win. They were up against a big university, but they were so pleased to have had a great season in their own right, and they were going. They were going to be on national television. It was going to be a really big deal for this little college. And one of the senior boys who had never started a game... In all the years that he had been at that college, he only got in when the team was way ahead or way behind. He comes to the coach and he says, I need to travel to the bowl game on my own. Immediately the coach, who was such a hurry, had hardly any time for this, this boy. He said, look, you know the rules. We, we travel as a team. He said, but coach, wait a minute. Coach, please slow down. You said if there's ever an emergency, you would reconsider and I've had an emergency. Okay, I'm listening. What is it? Please hurry. He said, I was just in the dorm, and I got a call from my mom. My dad just died. I'm an only child. I need to go home, and I, over the next several days, need to get things in order, and I literally need to bury my dad. But I've checked train schedules, and I can make it to the game. Now, I want you to think about this as it relates to your calling in Christ. You'll see the parallel here very clearly. This coach had given zero thought to this senior boy being a part of the big game. He was a bench warmer. Those of you that don't follow athletics, he just warmed the bench. You get it. He sat on the bench until the coach said, okay, we're far enough ahead or far enough behind. Hey, you, you can go on in for a few minutes. That's the life that he had lived, at least football-wise, for four years. This was going to be the last game of football, organized football, he would ever play. The coach had not given any thought to him being in the game. He wasn't important to the coach or to the team. That's how the coach saw it. Some of you have bought into that same lie. I'm a little too old. I'm not quite educated enough. I don't have enough influence. I don't have this. I don't have that. And God says, you're important to me. You're so important to me, regardless of what people say, that I was willing to send my own son to die for you. Well, this boy says to the coach, look, I'm just asking to be a little bit late in getting to the stadium that day. This coach actually thought he was being caring when he said to this young man, son, it's going to be a hassle for you to take that train and get all these states away. Why don't you just stay home with your mom? Because she's really going to need you. And you and I need to take a lesson from what this senior boy said to the coach. He said it lovingly, but he said it firmly. He said, Coach, I'm very surprised. And may I say, sir, disappointed in what you've just told me. Because I would hope that by these four years you would have come to know I'm going to be there for my team. I would never let them down by not showing up. He saw himself as a part of the greater body. And whether you are single or married, whether you have a past that you'd rather not talk about, whatever you have gone through in life, when you bring it to the foot of the cross and you have it covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, he makes all things new in your life and in mine. The coach would later tell a friend of his, 
I didn't have time. I didn't have another second for this senior boy. I had so many details to attend to. So I said to him, fine, son, come to the game when you can. And that coach never gave a single thought about that boy, about him burying his father, about the funeral, about the grief the family was going through. Nothing like that. He was too bent on something temporary. Somebody here tonight is as well. Coach never thought about him again until he showed up the day of the game. And he comes running up in uniform and he says, Coach, I made it. If you let me start today, sir, I assure you, you will not be sorry. The coach would later tell that same friend, I don't know what overcame me. Maybe I am getting older. Maybe I do have some compassion. Or maybe it was the fact that we'd already had the coin toss and I knew that we were going to get the kickoff. So I thought, I'll put the boy in for one play, let him block, take him out, no harm done. But you see, the very God who knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, the very God who knows the number of hairs on your head, can shut doors in business, can open doors in relationships, he can do things that you have not even thought about, Because He meets our needs before we even ask or think. And that same God might mess with your theology. I believe He can blow a wind and have a ball end up where it's not supposed to be. And that day, that's what happened. The bench warmer caught the ball. And He took off running with a passion that nobody had ever seen in the four years He'd been there. In that instant, the coach decided to leave Him in the game. Play after play after play. Offense and defense, as they did back in those days. He was clearly the most valuable player of the game. He was clearly the deciding factor in that little college upsetting the big university. He was carried off the field by his teammates. The press swarmed for the story. The opposing coach had the right to, and he exercised that right, to come over and ask to see the college transcripts of this boy. They didn't think he was even, you know, in school there. They'd never seen anything like that in the scouting reports. The coach, making his final check in the locker room when all was said and done, walking back to the old bus, happens to look down the tunnel. Looking there on the field, he sees one lone figure. You guessed it, it was that senior boy. He was never going to play again. He wasn't pro material. He had just had an amazing game, his final game of his college career. And the coach was, you could call it man enough or you could call it big enough to go all the way down through the tunnel, onto the field, cross the end zone and 50 yards out to the center where this big senior boy was just standing there taking it all in. And he was so happy. And the coach put his hand on the big boy's shoulder and he said, son, I owe you an apology. I just came out here to say I'm sorry. And this boy said, what are you sorry for, coach? You you let me start today. We had an amazing game. We won, coach. Why are you sorry? And he said, I'm sorry because I didn't believe in you. I, I, I just have to confess, I didn't even think about your dad's funeral. I didn't think about what you might be going through or what your mom was going through. I was so intent on this game. And I sure didn't have you in the plan. And here you were the deciding factor in us winning an amazing victory today. Could you just tell the old coach what made the difference? Because I've never seen in four years you ever play this way when you did get into a game. I never saw you with this passion when you were in practice. Could you just tell me, please, what made the difference today? He said, I'm happy to tell you, coach, and I'll tell you this way. You never met my mom and dad, and he was embarrassed, and rightfully so. He had met the parents of what he deemed to be the important boys on the team, you see. How many of us, though we are followers of Christ, make assessments based upon worldly things? When God's the one that looks at your heart and looks at her heart and looks at that minister's heart and looks at that family's heart and you and I are standing up here making our assessments and we have no clue what's going on in their heart. 
He said, I'm sorry to say I never did meet your parents. And then as if he had an inspired thought, he said, but you know, I observed something about your parents. I, I believe your parents were very much in love. He said, Coach, they were very much in love, but what makes you say that? He said, every time I saw them on campus near the stadium, I always saw them walking arm in arm. And I just thought, that's nice. They really love each other. He said, Coach, the reason that they always walked arm in arm when you saw them near the stadium is because my dad is a blind man. And when he'd get close to the stadium, he would always put his white cane away because he thought it would be an embarrassment to his son if other boys saw my dad stumbling along with his cane. You asked me a simple question, Coach. What made the difference today? For four years, for four years, I have sat on the bench and I have hoped every single game that I would get in and I would do something great and that my blind father sitting up in the stands would at least hear over the loudspeaker his son had done something and it would make him proud. But coach, you know, and I know, that didn't happen in four years. So what made the difference today in me, coach? It's simple. Ten days ago, my daddy died. And I realized that today would be the first game he ever watched me play. When you know your daddy's looking, doesn't it make a difference? When you know you're living for the Savior, doesn't it matter? When you know that you're going to one day stand before Him and hear Him say, Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy that I have prepared for you. It ought to change the way we live. Change the way we give. Change the way we think. Change the way we forgive. Change the way we celebrate Christmas. Change the way we do our worship time. It ought to change us. Little girl asked her mommy, how does a caterpillar become a butterfly? She said, well, dear, the caterpillar has to want to fly so badly, it's willing to stop crawling. Tonight, when this is all over, the leadership here, we want to invite you to stop crawling. We want you to take wings like never before. And by the way, a little boy who saw a caterpillar, butterfly trying to come out of the encasement, thought he was doing a good deed when he went and got his mom's scissors and cut that little side slit so that that newly formed butterfly could get out easier. But if you know anything about biology, you know that when he took away the stress and the strain of him flexing those wings, he took away his ability to fly. You see, the caterpillar has to wiggle out of the encasement, and it's a great strain. Sometimes they even die in the process. But when they're going through that strain of getting free, it forces the fluid from their body out into their wings, and they unfold with strength. All oh, those who wait upon the Lord, they mount up with wings as eagles. They run and they don't get weary. They walk and they don't faint. My prayer for you is that though you may have gone through some trials where you would have just cut the trial open to be done with it, that from this day forward you would say, not mine, but thine. And if it means going through a test, then I know it's for my testimony. And even if I once made a mess, you can make a message out of it. And I am through being a bench warmer. I'm through letting the world tell me what I should and could and couldn't do. Instead, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to move from one realm of glory to another, even tonight. And in that process, my friend, my hope for you 
is that as you come off the bench, as you think about making a difference in this life, that you just keep your eyes on the finish line. When Florence Chadwick went back and did that Catalina to California swim, she consulted every weatherman in the valley. And that's okay. There's victory in a myriad of of, uh, the counselors as long as they're giving you good counsel. But you know what? There's only one who can order the weather. The others can prophesy about it. And so when Florence Chadwick went down with the entire television crew watching, and she began her swim, the fog rolled in even worse than it had two months before. Some of you think that the trial is finally over. And so you ease off. And you give up a little of your prayer time. And you don't get quite as diligent in the scripture time. And then all of a sudden another flood comes through. Another wave of fog overtakes you and your family. Why did you give up, you ask? Why did I back away? Why didn't I continue? Florence Chadwick had a resolve that day. And though she couldn't see a foot in front of her, she knew, she knew that the finish line was there. She swam with a zeal and a passion, and she not only broke the women's world record for that course, but she broke the men's world record that day too. They asked her, how did you do it? She said, I just saw the finish line. I just kept my eyes on the finish line. You couldn't see. No, I kept my eyes on the finish line. We walk by and not by. There are two days on your calendar. This day and that day. Keep your eyes fixed on the finish line. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege of being able to come to worship you with my brothers and sisters in Christ, to open your word, to remind my fellow Christians, regardless of their background, their stripe, their heritage, their traditions, no, no sections in heaven, but for the blood-bought saints. And so now, Lord, I just stand down here with any who are blood-bought saints, If you're a blood-bought saint, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're banking on the reality of redemption by His perfect righteousness and not your own works of righteousness, if you are my brother and sister in Christ, regardless of your background, would you just stand up with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, I speak a blessing over each one of your saints, each one who has identified as stepping across the line that we will no longer walk by sight, but we will walk by faith. We will be moved by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit ever abiding in us, not just hovering over us as in the Old Testament, but living in us. And my prayer as we continue the rest of this service and on into the evening, in the afterglow, in additional prayer time, in discussions, in commitments being made and decisions being given, I pray that all of us here would say, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. In Jesus' name, amen.